okay looks like today we'll have a, a fewer people coming in because some of them probably have long weekend plans so we'll get started uh, unlike last time okay so like always a uh, quick survey how was the homework was it easy hard medium hard medium okay medium hard okay so medium hard okay hard perfect okay i didn't have time to finish okay okay so uh, each one answer once rohan i see you are answering multiple times okay so hard okay okay so we'll go through in little more detail because i'm seeing more hards and almost no easies okay having no report was amazing okay 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 cool so okay got it yeah yeah some of you might feel different problems are hard different problems are easy so uh, let's uh, let's dive in okay can you guys see my screen okay good thank you okay so let's open the first question shorter class because of long weekend you can have shorter homework because of long weekend if you want class will be same length okay cool <laughs> okay so okay already people are starting to annotate disable participant annotations and then clear all drawings okay yeah this is something that i have to remember each time otherwise shorter class plus homework no La same class and shorter homework <laughs> okay so first one i think i said it's not easy so first let's skip first one and then do this one first because this one is relatively easier compared to first one so how many of you felt second one was easy second one was easy okay medium okay okay cool so let's take the number and try to do it again so number is uh, is my screen too small is it visible now okay good yeah yeah let's do it actually yeah let's do it by talking don't share code uh, if you want to share code at the end of the problem we can do so how do you check let's uh, instead of this big number how do you check if 24 is a prime number or not how do you check if it is a prime number or not in words not in program in words even okay so how about 25 so 25 is odd okay square root divide by every number less than square root okay so so monishka has it right so divide by every number less than square root see if it is even or odd if odd then check other odd numbers yeah yeah so basically what you half of that number half is not necessary so square root is sufficient let's see something simple uh i'll try with the whiteboard here if i can do it well enough stop sharing my screen and then share whiteboard okay so if you have a number like 25 you can so someone was saying first check if it's even or odd so first divided by 2 so it's odd it's a 25 is not divisible by 2 so it's not even 
Hence, you have to. Someone was saying you have to check with every odd number that's less than half of twenty-five. What's half of twenty-five? Twelve and a half. Twelve and a half. Okay, so we'll check because well, let's check up to thirteen. Okay, so do I really need to check with every num every odd number less than thirteen, like three, five, seven? Nine, eleven, and thirteen. Do I really have to check with all these odd numbers to know whether twenty-five is odd or not? Of course, here I'm lucky that uh, twenty-five ended up being a factor of five. But even if it wasn't, do I have to check all the odd numbers? Okay, how many of you know what is prime factorization? Before we go to this. i know it's little bit deviation into math but with understanding of that math we can attack this programming problem much more efficiently so what's the how, what is prime factorization finding all prime factors of a number is it just finding all fi prime factors of a number or, or anything more finding how many times it appears absolutely so the prime factorization of 25 is 5 uh, squared right so 5 times 5 and why is prime factorization important yeah 12 is 2 squared times 3 why is prime factorization important anybody if you want to say you can message and uh, i i'll ask one of the reason it's on uh, bus higher than square root of the, uh, yeah yes and no yes and no helps to find all prime factors of a number yeah it's that's of course true of prime factorization but why why do you study prime factorization in school why don't you study uh, sums like why don't we write 12 as 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 6 why isn't this as interesting writing as sum in fact if uh, any of you know of this medal called fields medal that's uh, considered to be the equivalent of uh, actually abel prize is considered to be the equivalent of nobel prize in mathematics as some of you might know or all of you might know there is no math, math uh, nobel prize for mathematics uh, no square root is not faster lcm and gcf uh, not really let's see so i'll tell you my story first so with sums of something uh, what it is is there is this thing called abel prize which is equivalent of nobel prize and then there is this thing called fields medal which is a prestigious award in mathematics it's only awarded to mathematicians below the age of 40 and they should achieve something very substantial and they should and it's only given out once every 4 years one of the fields medal winners is actually at ucla one of the youngest field medal fields medal winner is a professor at ucla called teren stow he actually found out that every number can be written as sum of primes and he proved that it's called some ben green and tau theorem so it's pretty interesting but why is in 12 equal to 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 6 interesting how many ways can you write as 12 as the sum of some other numbers how many ways can you write it you can write it as 1 plus 11 a lot right and that's why it's not interesting but how many ways can you write 12 as the product of prime numbers how many yeah exactly so that's why prime factorization is interesting to people it's not because no not using decimals only using natural numbers how many ways can you prime factorize a natural number only using natural numbers how many ways just one and that's why it's interesting uh, that's why prime factorization is interesting and taught in school and that's what we are going to target right now so knowing that prime factorization is uh, unique
Now, assuming that 25 is the product of some prime numbers, P1 and P2 and so on, what is the largest, assume that P1 is the largest prime that is a factor of 25 or whatever number. Is there a pattern between prime numbers? There are lots of patterns between prime numbers. I'll actually mention one in a few more minutes. So P1, let's assume that P1 is the largest prime. I'm just assuming that there is only two primes here. You can write 10 primes. Let's assume strictly that P1 is greater than P2 is great, greater than or equal to greater than or equal to P3. So the largest prime that we have to check is P1, right? How large can it be? It can be as large as the other prime, right? P2. So if it's only P1, P2, and if P1 equal to P2, then it is P1 squared. So the number is no larger than P1 squared, right? So P1 squared is greater than or equal to P1, P2. Let me erase everything and write it more clearly. So if we have a number n, if we had a number n whose prime factorization is equal to P1 times P2 times P3 times so on, where P1 is greater than or equal to P2, greater than or equal to P3 and so on, now, if I multiply with P1 all, all across, so P1 squared is greater than P1, P2, greater than or equal to P1, P3, right? Now, multiply everything with uh, uh, P1 again. So, P1 cubed is greater than P1 or multiply everything with P2 again. So this is P1, P2, P3. So this is our number. P2 times P1 squared is greater than that number, right? So this P2 times P1 squared is less than or equal to P1 cubed. So whatever is the number, if you take the largest prime, and, uh, if you take the largest prime and you cube it or square it, but it is only P1 and P2 are equal to each other. No, I'm, I'm assuming greater than or equal to. Shruti. So P1 greater than or equal to P2 greater than or equal to P3, right? So in prime factorization, that is true, right? You can have either two prime factors equal or the prime factors are just strictly greater. And since it is unique, this is all fine. So what we can establish is that P1 cube is greater than P2 P1 squared. That means whatever is the largest prime factor, if it's uh, if you assume that every other number is equal to it, then you would get that factor cubed or that factor power four or whatever the power. But I just wanted to say P1 squared is good enough. Because if I assume that P1 is the largest prime factor, I should multiply P1 with something else to get P2, right? So if P1 is the largest prime factor, I don't have to go any further than P1 to find it. How did you get P1 cube is greater than P2 times P1 squared? I just multiplied P. P1 times P1 squared is greater than or equal to P2 times P1 squared, right? Because these are all natural numbers. This is greater than, strictly greater than or equal to. But just coming back to this one. So if I know that P1 is the largest prime factor, the next one can be just as large or less than P2. So P1 squared or P1 times P1 is the largest pair that I can find. I cannot find any other pair where P1 times P2. Hence, if I just look at the square root of this number and assume that's P1, it cannot be any more than that. Just to see it numerically, if I assume 25, Square root of 25, I can't is 5, lucky. Let's say 34, what's the square root of 34? 5 point something. So if 7 is a prime number greater than 5, 7 times whatever is the prime number next to it, 7 times 5, right? I cannot have any other prime number greater than 7 be a factor because uh, If a prime number greater than, 
if no number before that is a factor so assuming that no other prime numbers like 5 3 2 are factors then no other number greater than 7 can be a factor also because it has to multiply with one of these numbers to get 34 right so as soon as i establish that 7 is not a factor i have eliminated any further need because no other number bigger than this can multiply with any other prime number smaller than this to get this of course this is a wrong example but that's the thought can i explain that again yeah sure so let's take some other slightly larger number and then do it numerically let's pick uh, something that's not uh, so let's take 49 is 49 divisible by 2 no 3 no 5 no let's actually take uh, uh, 143 instead of 49 so that uh, it's more easier to see is it divisible by 7 is it divisible by 11 yes is it divisible by 13 yeah it's divisible by 11 if you want to is it divisible by 13 yes do i have to check any other number greater than 13 because assuming if there is any other prime factor greater than 13 Let's go with seventeen. It has to multiply with any one of these to get one forty-three, right? So once I have crossed the square root point, the square root of one forty-three is close to twelve. One forty-four is twelve, right? So once I cross the square root of the number, I don't have to check any other further number. If I have eliminated all the primes below the square root, I don't have to check any other number. I can establish that this number is prime. so give me a four three digit prime number is 171 prime do you know is 171 prime anybody let's google is 171 looks like prime no it's not prime okay is 173 prime okay divisible by 3 good point is 173 prime yes okay so 173 so let's check 173 with the same calculation so let's see if we can uh, eliminate uh, 173 is there a way to predict the next prime number even when we get really large prime numbers or is the only way actually there are a couple of uh, i don't know what's the beeping sound but okay okay let's continue so 173 what's the square root of 173 Thirteen something. Okay, so we'll just check every odd num, every fag, prime number up to thirteen or let's say seventeen. Let's check up to seventeen. So, so this is thirteen something. So we'll check up to seventeen. So is one seventy three divisible by two? No. Three. Five seven nine five seven eleven. Obviously, now that you know the answer, thirteen and seventeen, and I don't have to check any further than this because the next prime, nineteen, has to multiply with one of these to get you one seventy three, and we have already eliminated all of these. So that's the general idea. But let's implement the simple idea first. Let's take the number twenty five. one way to know that whether it is prime or not is to find out for all numbers in this range or just less than the number 
if any of them divides this number if number percentile i equal to 0 then print composite right if any number divides it it's composite can i say else prime immediately can i say if it does not divide if let's say 2 does not divide 25 or if 25 is not divisible by 2 can i say it's prime just by checking that one number no okay so i can't write the else immediately so how do you write such a loop where i can only print one way to do this is actually by using something called flags or this is called as a flag there is no special thing you can use a for loop but member is prime assume that member is prime at the beginning and set this to be false so if it is divisible then the member is prime is false right so i'm starting by assuming that number is prime if i find a factor then i say number is prime is false and then i'll print number is prime at the end so it says false right as you as expected can i even break it here if all i am doing is check for whether it is prime or not as soon as i find a factor i know it's no longer prime right so i can even break this here right does everyone agree that i can break as soon as i find a factor and say it's not a prime number okay so we break it and then it's literally fast so for 25 it seems to happen almost immediately but if i check this large number not very large but let's check this large number as i said this is the brute force method checking every number it's taking little bit of time but it still finishes now if i add two more digits are we coding at code oh sorry i i am i'm probably still sharing the whiteboard sorry uh, close this stop share and then i'll share my screen oh can you see now Can you see the code now? Okay, cool. So it's now printing that. Uh, let's run this again. So it's still running. So see, as numbers are growing large, it's taking longer and longer. How can I make it faster? Oh, absolutely there are lots of faster ways we'll explore all those yeah we'll explore step by step so what's one way to make it fast it's taking too long so i want to make it slightly faster is there any way to make it faster by going to check only odd numbers yeah so both shashikala and shrayan actually gave two answers two ways to make it faster so one way to make it faster is I don't have to check any other even number after two, right? Only two. I only have to check two. So I'll check two specially. And say if uh, number percentage two number is prime equal to false. Else I'll put all this in the else. And then I'll start with two. I sort of start with three and keep jumping by two. So that's only odd numbers, right? So this should increase the speed a little bit. Wouldn't you say mod two? Yeah, percentage two is the same as mod two, right? Increment by two. Yeah, check only odd. Yes. I do not like... think this will work. Why? You have to switch the number and two around. The increment is on the third part of the range. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Syntax. Okay. Okay, this will work. Do you think this will work? Yes. Except two is also a prime number. But we are not doing prime number, right? 
So this is the increment. So we want to only check with odd numbers. We don't want to check uh. with even numbers. That's all. So let's try this one. Oops. Still relatively slow, not finishing. So what can we do? We can also add a check to say, if i greater than number power 0.5 and number is prime, actually if i greater than 0.5, then again break because now we know that the number has to be prime. So we'll only keep continuing this as long as we set the number to fall, number as prime to false. So if we got up to here, that means it's stopping. So it finished already. So this time it finished in about a second, right? So we made it relatively fast. So I'll go through the steps a bit. Why are you multiplying by 0.5? I'm not multiplying by 0.5. I'm exponentiating by 0.5. So this is uh, 100 power 0.5 is 10, square root of 100. Okay. So yeah, this double asterisk, maybe it's not very clear. Yeah, square rooting, yeah. So if, if I go all the way up to square root of the number and I have still not found a factor, I can abandon. That's what we established a little bit earlier, right? So then I can abandon and I just say, no, it's not. It's a prime number, definitely. So this whole thing is just to find out whether a given number is a prime number. So this will help solve our smaller number in almost no time. Of course, there are faster methods. We'll look at an even slightly faster method. So it prints that this is a prime number, right? We can also use the list from Young. Yeah, yeah, I think that's what I mentioned in the hint, right? Like, yeah, you can also use. I, I skipped first one to do the second one. So this is just to check whether a number is prime or not. Is everyone convinced that this checks that the number is prime or not? This is not to check, generate a list. Mm, yes, I agree. Okay, cool. Anyone disagrees? Can you explain I number? Oh, as soon as, soon as I check, all the way up to square root of the number, I don't have to check any other number because any other prime that's larger than the square root of the number has to multiply with one of the smaller primes that are less than the square root of the number to get the number. So number has to be a product of some prime greater than square root times prime less than square root. If we have already eliminated that there are no such prime numbers, this is gone, right? We have eliminated this, then there cannot be anything here. So once I go to any number that is greater than prime square root of the number, since I have eliminated all the factors before that, there cannot be any other greater factor. Hence the number has to be prime. Yeah, two asterisks means exponentiation. So this is a good use of breaks basically. So you, without using the break, as you noticed, when I didn't add this break, it was taking longer. When I don't add this break, it still takes a lot of time. So adding breaks makes the code finish its job much faster. So now the next thing. So how to find out, find all primes greater than or up to and before we do this, how many of you know without actually finding how many primes are there less than, let's say, 10,000? Actually, some of you may remember this was a question on your uh, test at the beginning. Uh, this one, yeah. No, not a good, um, good amount. Yeah, good, good answer. So this was the question set of prime numbers that are less than 10 million. How many prime numbers are there less than 10 million? Can you, is there any way to know that without actually going through every number? 
uh, aditya seva for a sense uh, tells you what are all the primes without actually finding out yeah so basically sieve methods so some of you mentioned sieves right sieves are just ways of uh, filtering out or establishing constraints so that you can uh, write down numbers that qualify they are like re- programs basically sieve of error someone mentioned here sieve of error to error to sinis i'm probably pronouncing that very wrong but i will explain the method in a bit uh, is a way to find out all the primes up to a given number n but without actually finding all the primes up to a given number n how do you find out how many primes are there without actually listing okay simpler question how many odd numbers are there less than 10 million no sum of factorization is also for aditya jain what is what do you mean by sum of factorization you can speak out right so okay we can maybe uh, talk later so so for you, you you knew immediately how many yeah so 10 million yeah so you knew immediately how many odd numbers are there right how many odd numbers are there less than 10 million 5 million how many powers of 2 are there less than 10 million how many powers of 2 are there less than 10 million for those of you who feel we are not doing programming stuff we are doing lot of thinking stuff and thinking is about programming lot of these things are useful 3254 3254 question mark 19 so how do you find out audio okay again bad audio let me see if i switch will it become better Okay, is it any better now? Okay, good. Okay. Okay. So, how many powers of two are less than ten million? How many of you know how to find this exactly? Thousand twenty-four times thousand twenty-four is one million, right? Times eight. Yeah, very nice. Okay, cool. So we can use code. You can use code. Yeah. How many? So using code, how do you find out how many powers of two are less than ten million? Whatever you want to use, I don't mind how you use. I'll just explain the mathematical method. How many of you have heard of logarithms? <coughs> okay. So you just basically take log. of 10 million base 2 right so what's log of 10 million base 2 you don't have to have a calculator to do that so log uh, 10 base 2 is uh, roughly 3.2 uh, right so this is 10 power 6 so multiply this with uh, 6 so that's about 20 roughly so roughly 20 i'm probably approximating too much that's why i'm getting 20 but if you check you will find that 23 or 24 there are only 23 or 24 powers of 2 less than 10 million how do i know 2 power 10 is 10 power 10 1024 power 20 is 1024 times 1024 which is roughly about 1 million 1 million or a little bit over 1 million so 2 power 23 or 2 power 24 should be 16 times 1 million so this is greater than that so there can be no more than 23 maybe there are 22 maybe there are 23 but there can be no more than 24 so we'll say 23 primes so all these estimations are essential when we do programs that involve very large numbers 
writing a brute force program like the first one we tried might work for small numbers and in this class later on in the classes we will try to explore very large data sets and some of these honing of math estimation skills right so the logarithm tells you that how many perfect squares are less than 10 million how do you find that logarithm sorry i don't have that much time to go over this you can google and find out what's logarithm uh, just quick intro to logarithm is if you do 2 power some number 2 power some number x is equal to 10 million then x is equal to log of that 10 million to the base 2 if you have a wolfram alpha anyone has used wolfram alpha you can try this so log base 2 of 10 million is uh, 23.25 uh is the sum of factors n divided by log n of n is the sum of factors n divided by ln of n uh, aditya what do you mean by sum of factors sum of factors of what so what you mentioned is yeah no that's not sum of factors sum of factors is something else but yeah what you mentioned is the prime number theorem uh someone was mentioning so let's finish the square root how many squares are less than 10 million how do you find that how do you find how many squares are less than 10 million anybody square root okay so square root of 10 million is 10 million is 10 power 7 right so 10 how do you estimate the square root of 10 million so it's 10 power 7 so that's just 10 times 10 power 6 and take the square root separately the square root of 10 is about 3.16 times 10 cube so about 3162 squares are less than for log 2 yeah yeah you can do programmatically good point satvik So three thousand one sixty two. Yeah, you can do all of these things programmatically. There is no need to do this by hand. I am doing it by hand just to show you the math behind it, not to show you the programming behind it. You can definitely do it programmatically using some existing functions. Uh, that's not really something that uh, we'd, I'd like to go over. You can Google and find out. Now coming to prime numbers, there is something called as prime number theorem. For which, actually, when we started this class, I think the i don't know what the what number but a recent proof there are lots of proofs of prime number theorem but the recent proof for prime number theorem was found maybe like two weeks ago or three weeks ago so basically it's called pi of x that is number of primes less than number of primes less than x so pi of x is equal to x divided by log of x so that tells you how many prime numbers are there logarithm basically tells you how many digits are there in a number so if i tell you the log of this number is 7 how many digits how many zeros are there in this number basically so 7 zero so the log of this number is 7 so logarithm closely tells you roughly how many digits are there so the log of 20000 this is just about 7.23010 so it roughly tells you how many digits are there so if you take a number x and divide it by of course this one is a small problem this is to base e then we multiply with something but roughly how many digits are there so if you take a number and divide by roughly how many digits are there in that number then you would get a good bound for how many primes are there this is not exact number this is close to the number of primes so this is a way to find it but coming back to finding all the primes less than n so going to whiteboard again okay share again whiteboard so uh, this time we'll again do this uh, this thing somebody was mentioning who was mentioning uh, sieve so if anyone wants to explain what is this uh, sieve that you guys were mentioning who was who somebody had typed mugil i think and aditya jain 
Aditya said he doesn't have mic, but Mugil, do you have mic? Yeah. So you basically take all the um, basic prime numbers from like one to ten, so like two, three, five, seven, and then after that you find all their multiples and you cross them out. Like you write all their multiples and cross them out. So you can the ones that are left behind after you've crossed out all the basic multiples would be the prime numbers. Right. Very good point. Almost right. Just small minor, minor variation. Right. You will have to still uh, go through every number. So see if uh, I'll probably butcher the name again, but I'll Google next time. And uh, this technique we can just say to uh, I missed four. What it says is take a list. So if you want to find all the primes less than ten, take a list of all numbers from two through ten. First, pick the first number. Strike out all the factors of that number. Then pick the next number that's there on the list. Strike out all its factors. Then pick the next number which is not struck out already and strike out all its factors. Pick the next number, strike out all its factors. There are no more factors. So whatever are left at the end are all the prime numbers less than that number. This is about a 2000 year, 2400 year old method, actually not a modern method. We'll try to implement this programmatically. Some of you already have implemented it in your code. Maybe you don't know the name, maybe you know the name, but others who know, some of you seem to have written it in your notes also that name of the method. So we'll try to implement this using programming here. Is the method clear? Okay, so there is a small, okay, method is clear, okay, good. So there is a small problem whenever you take, you say, take a list like this. Of course, when mathematicians do this, they are not taking big numbers probably, right? They're taking small numbers and doing it by hand. Ancient mathematicians may even have done big numbers by hand like this. But if we want to do this with a billion, taking a list with a billion numbers is useless because you know half of them are even anyways. So you don't need to, Rohan, why do you want to control the screen? Uh, Rohan, Rohan Koditala. Okay. So you can take, uh, Okay, you can take a small list like this and do this, but if I let's say want to do a big number, a billion, taking a list with a billion numbers is excessive, right? Some of you might agree that it is too much. So there is a smaller shortcut to do this in programming and most programming languages use this. So I'll go from, let's say I want to only go up to 100,000. So I just want to find out all the prime numbers less than 1001. So I'll start from, I'll start from three because again, I don't want to uh, go through a lot of numbers. So I'll just start from three because I know already two is a prime number. I'll create a list of primes only. So I start with primes equal to two because that's the first prime number and I already know. And the reason I do that is because I know two is the only even prime, right? All of you agree with that also, I'm hoping. Since two is the only even prime, I don't have to keep writing it. And then using the same trick that I did earlier, I don't have to keep going through every number. That's also another two. Oh, I'm a typing code. Yeah, I'm typing code. Good point. I keep forgetting to share my screen and then share my... Can you see my code now? Okay, cool. No problem. Sorry. Uh, I, I have to keep switching between this whiteboard and uh, code. But anyways, so I start by assuming a list of primes called with just one element in it called two. Then I'm going through the range of odd, odd numbers between three to 1001. Why only odd numbers? Because we know all other even numbers are struck out because of the first factor alone. Then I check basically, I'll repeat this method to find out is the number prime or not. So I say for number in range, then I'll repeat this method for i in range 
of this number if number percentage i number is a prime so i start by assuming that number is prime so I, all i'm doing is i'm repeating the same code now i don't have to go through all the primes i just have to go through primes so for i in primes so i'm just checking whether the number is divisible by any prime instead of checking for every number i did this small trick and at the end of this loop i am saying if number is prime then add to primes so let's see if this does anything so it printed some numbers let's see how many primes are there One sixty-eight. I'll go to OEIS, Online Encyclopedia of Integer Sequences. Ah, this is uh, less than thousand. Uh, so this list will tell us. Uh, Oh, they are they are not showing us all of them as a simple table. Too bad. Yeah. So one sixty eight. So I'll just Google and see is that correct? How many prime numbers are less than thousand? Oops, ten thousand. Uh, one sixty eight. So that's the exact number of prime numbers. So we found out all the prime numbers i'll go through the code now actually you know what you guys can also try shouldn't we append yeah we are appending right ah. so i'll just go over the code piece by piece so what did i do i first assumed a list of prime numbers i just added 2 to it right that's a that's hopefully a simple assumption then i'm looping through all the numbers between 3 to 1001 because i really want to find out all the prime numbers up to 1000 right find all primes up to 1000 so i'm looping through all the odd numbers between 3 to 1001 when i jump by 2 that means i am looping through all odd numbers only each time i assume that the number is prime then i'm only checking if the number has a prime factor since i have a list of prime numbers i'm checking if this number between 3 to 1001 all the odd numbers between 3 to 1001 do they have any prime factor or not if they don't have a prime factor which means number is prime then i am appending that number to the list of primes so as i am building this list i am as i am going through numbers i am adding to the primes list and i am extending the list also so as i check each number and i find that it is a prime i am appending it to the primes list so by the end i have a list of all the primes and this is a very quick way and this is exactly shouldn't you check i greater than number yeah i am checking that right yeah before checking for prime uh, this is a diff this whole for loop is different from this if right varsha this this is within the for loop that checking for uh, number greater than uh, varsha did that answer your question i am not sure no can you say again so as i'm going through the numbers so let's say i have a number 177 i just have to check i'm trying to check whether that number has any prime factor so i'm looping through all the primes and i'm checking if the number has a prime factor then i am assuming the number is not prime if it doesn't have a prime factor i'm going all the way up to the square root of the number if it still didn't have a factor then i'm assuming that the number is prime right this for loop checks whether the number is prime or not at the end of the for loop if the number is still considered to be prime then the number is as is added to the list of primes shouldn't the if statement be before the break uh you mean like this here 
Yeah, no, almost no difference, but yeah, this probably would do it also. Only problem is, uh, yeah, no problem actually. Yeah, this would also do it. Only it only eliminates one number checking, right? Which eliminates the last number because once you cast the square root of uh, the number, you only will go to one more number beyond that, right? Anyway, so that's it. This is a programmatic implementation of the ancient sieve. Now, how many of you know actually other sieves other than sieve of uh, Eratosthenes? Or how many of you have heard? If you are interested, you guys can Google this polymath project. Uh, cooking sieve, yeah, good point, yeah, very good. Could you use the list from number one for number three? Yeah, absolutely, you can use the list for number one for number three, yeah. So this polymath, uh, it's called bounded gap conjecture. So bounded gaps between primes. So what this says is, if you list the prime numbers that are, uh, let's list the prime numbers that are less than 1001. If you notice the gap between three and five, what's the gap between three and five? What's five minus three? Two. What's 11 minus 13 or 13 minus 11? Two. 17, 19? 29, 31? 41, 43? 59, 61, 71, 73? 101, 103, 107, 109. So what this says is, as you, as you see, prime numbers are relatively rare, but surprisingly, there are a lot of prime numbers that are two apart from each other. So this observation is actually called twin prime conjecture, an unproven theorem where it states that there are infinitely many pairs of prime numbers that are two numbers apart. It's not proven yet. This, how, if you probably have watched this movie called uh, Beautiful Mind, is that the movie I'm probably remembering right now? Beautiful Mind, is that the John Nash movie or is that the, no, this is different one. Uh, I'll think of the movie. So we can prove it and become famous. If you prove it, you will become very famous, yeah. If you prove 10 prime conjecture, you'll probably become very famous. So in 2013, there was there's this Chinese mathematician called, but you can't prove it, there are infinite numbers. Uh, now there are ways to prove it. Uh, his name is, I think, Eating Zhang. No, Eating Zhang. Yeah, so this mathematician called Eating Zhang, he became very famous in 2013. In fact, this is a story worthy of making a movie. He was, he's in UC Santa Barbara now. Uh, his uh, story is worthy of making a movie. He had, he was a very good mathematician as a child, then lost interest in mathematics, started working in subway, then proved something called as bounded gap conjecture, which is similar to the twin prime conjecture, but it states something different. It states that, not Ethan Zhang, Yi Tang Zhang, his, Chinese name may be slightly different. His American name is Yitang Zhang. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. So what he did is he went and found out that there are infinitely many pairs of numbers that have a gap of 70 million between them. Currently, we have proof to say that there are infinitely many primes a difference of 246 between them. So there are infinitely many prime numbers where if you take the pair of numbers, they are 246 apart. But nobody has still proven the twin prime conjecture. So he used uh, Zhang's sieve or Zhang sieve or sieve of Zhang to find this. Anyway, so once you find out the list of all prime numbers, you can do use the same trick to find out 10,000 first prime number. And you can use the same trick to find out the prime factors of this number, number of factors of this number, and sum of all factors of this number. So that's, once you find out the list of all primes, you can do all of those relatively straightforward. Now let's take up this slightly challenging problem. 
how many of you understood the question and attempted this because i think we gave points for those who attempted also oh what would be the range for number 1 so good point so someone asked a good question so for good yeah actually i escaped away there right so what is the range for this so instead of using a range whoever is asking that question you would use this right while length of primes less than 10001 and then number start with number equal to 3 so use a while loop so that you don't have to write, write a range so at the end of this while loop you increment to number equal to number plus 3 or sorry number plus 2 so this is one easy trick i used count you could what count yeah sure you can use count probably yeah or you can use that prime number theorem that i mentioned and you know that 10000 first prime number so to have 10001 prime numbers you should go if you take 10 million let's say for example you take 10 million that's divided by 7 you'll have about 147000 primes here so if you want to go up to 1 million you'll have 14000 primes so go up to 1 million you'll have lot more than 14000 primes in 1 million so you can go up to 1 million yeah the last one that's the answer whoever is uh, whoever mentioned the answer uh, shruti it's uh, shruti satyanarayan square root is not really a method right it's a way to break the factor faster that's all so if you write a while loop and you go all the way up to the last factor it's slower so this one just says uh, try to find the factor so you just go all the way up to square root of n so your loop finishes faster that's all so it's not like a method it's just a way to make your loop faster that's all so for those of you who didn't understand this question hope i don't know if the diagram was helpful but if for a given number in a the diagram was super helpful i couldn't okay, thank you. okay cool so if you if you take it a look at a number in a grid like this for those of you who don't know what's a grid you might have used excel files in the past so if you take an excel file look at a given cell in an excel file you can go you can define adjacent numbers in eight different ways so these are the eight different directions so you can either go horizontally to right or left vertically down or up then you can go these are like the directions uh, you either go north east west south and then northeast uh, southwest and uh, i am very poor with directions north west and south east so you go th through all the eight directions oh <laughs> good point i look back at the notes okay good to know that you are look back at last year's notes so you can try to do this in eight different directions i and j are like the coordinates absolutely so for those of you who know who know coordinate geometry if you take a point on a let me try to share my whiteboard again or actually not the whiteboard let's cancel the whiteboard and share the screen again and go to geogebra hopefully all of you guys use something like this in your school work also uh, so if you take a graph sheet like this and uh, remove all these uh, noisy bars so each of this is like a grid line right position in a row exactly so someone already mentioned so this point is 1 0 this point is 1 1 this point is 2 1 right this point is 2 2 and so on so these are like positions of numbers in the grid or positions of integral points on a graph paper so that's exactly what we are looking at here 
And if you want to draw adjacent lines in a graph paper, you could draw it like this, right? You can draw a line this way, you can draw a line up, down, or on the sides. And that's what I did in this. So I'll take this number. But the first thing I mentioned here, if let's take this uh, grid first. So if I print this number grid, hopefully I copied it properly. Okay, so I'll print for uh, list in number grid, print list. So as you can see here, this is also like points in the, you should have a break in class. Yeah, next time we'll plan for a break. I separated four different types of products for each direction given in the diagram. Yeah, you can separate four, you can separate six, whatever directions you want. I think eight was just to make sure you check all of them. Not today, yeah, next time we'll plan for next time. So what did I do? I looped through the list. So for row, I want to say row in list. So for a no row in number grid, I'm printing each row, nothing fancy. So I'm calling each of these a row. Then what can I do? I can loop through for element in row, print the element. So now it would print uh, somewhat. So it prints a row and then, so prints all the elements then prints the row. So this is, you need a nested for loop like this to access all the elements. So if you, need, if you do a for loop within a for loop, you can access all the elements, right? Could we have turned it into a 1D list? So Satvik, if you turn it into a 1D list, you will lose the sense of direction, right? If you turn it into a 1D list, so everything becomes flat, you no longer have eight directions. So if you turn it into a 1D list, it would make it a lot more difficult because you have to, how do you know that, uh, let's take a look at it here once I print this. So when I print it this way, eight and 49 are adjacent to each other. Once I turn this into a 1D list, So Shrayan, what do you mean by you can do it with a one-do list? Yeah, you can still do it, but how? Shrayan? Okay, so if you have if you have converted this to one-do list and you ended up getting the answer, that's just because you were actually lucky because the answer is a horizontal number somewhere like this. If the answer involved diagonals, yeah, your code, you probably did it as a one-day list, but the reason why you got the answer is, uh, if you come, hmm. okay, Shru Shruti Satyanarayan, what do you mean by, yeah, someone explained to me, I'm not sure I understand, but what do you mean by convert to a one-day list, Shruti? Okay. Anyone, whoever uh, the answer diagonal not horizontal. Oh, really? Okay. Answer ended up being diagonal. Yeah, I don't know uh, where the answer number is, but uh, anyway, so let's do it with the 2D list at the end. Yeah, it would be pretty difficult. Yeah, if you do it with 1D list, but you can do it if you want. So now that we have these rows, instead of doing it with rows and columns, I would do it with the indices. So I'll say with for row index in range zero comma length of number grid plus one and then print of uh, number grid of row. Hopefully this will print the same thing as the past of oh, no need of plus one. 
or row index, sorry. I did mistake. So it printed all the rows that I wanted. Then I can also go through for column index in range zero comma length of number grid of row index. I don't even have to say 20 by 20, but I can do it if you want. That doesn't really change anything. I'm writing it so that it uh, works always. So now I can print a column index. It will print all the 400 numbers. So this is how you could access all the numbers in that list. Unnecessary long loop, but you could do it. Now that we are looping through, could we use variables i and j? Sorry, I didn't try. Yeah, yeah, you can use i and j. That's what I'm doing it right now. So when you are looping through a two-day list, you need like a row index and a column index because you can think of these as rows and columns as I illustrated in this diagram here. Since we are thinking them of rows and columns, we can use row index and column index. Popularly, people use i and j for row and column indices. Since I use that notation in that, uh, uh, grid here, I'll continue with that. So if I want to calculate horizontal products, I need to calculate i, i j, product of elements i j, i j plus one, i j plus two, and i j plus three. But what happens when I go up to 77? So let me take this one, this one row. When I go up to 77, does it have three three neighbors anymore or does it have only two neighbors? Right, yeah, you could do try except. So for those of you who are saying like try except, you can do try except. The only problem with try except or anything is, if you know you are going to get a mistake, you are better off not making the mistake. Uh, but, Try except is for in situations where you are not, it's except is called exception, basically. So for someone who said that, except is exception, right? You don't want to stumble upon except, exceptions out of desire, but you should try to check for things and not make them go to an exception. So if, so how do I know that uh, a given number no longer has three neighbors in a given direction? Just look at horizontal right direction. For a number i comma j, for a number i comma j, exactly, for a number i comma j, when does this number or when does this uh, element no longer have three neighbors anymore? How do I know that? So in this chart, how do I make sure that there are always three numbers in this direction? and only then calculate the horizontal right product. Okay, perfect. So someone said J plus three less than number of columns, K plus three less than or equal to 19. Okay, cool, yeah. So J plus three less than. So basically your column index, so if you are, you want to get J plus three less than or equal to 20, right? Or less than 20, not even less than or equal to 20. So in our case, we'll say if J plus three, less than length of number grid of i, mm -hmm. then we know there are three products, right? So I'll calculate horizontal product equal to this, horizontal right product, because I want to do all products, even though I know there is symmetry and uh, you can, commutativity says I can do without it. So I want to say, Number grid, I'll do the bro, uh, crude way, which is without using another loop here, ij times ij plus one, ij plus two, and ij plus three. So I'm doing it really a very simple way here. So horizontal right product is this for me, multiplying four numbers at these positions. Yeah, yeah I can create a row count, column count, and yeah, I'm, I'm using those two. I'm just saying, I'm calling them i and j because that's what I used in this diagram because I didn't want to write row count, column count in the diagram. That's why I'm using. Can't we just have a list of products? Yeah, we'll have a list of products. So we'll have this called list of products. 
and then keep adding this list of products. We can keep adding this list of products. Now, without doing the entire thing in this class, now I want each of you to actually start answering this. How do I know horizontal left while going left? How do I know that there are three neighbors in the leftward direction? What is the condition to make sure that there are three neighbors when I'm going horizontally left? Okay. J minus three greater than zero. So let me draw it in this thing. I'll take a screenshot of this. Minus three instead of plus three. Yeah, so minus three instead of plus three, but also different uh, limit, right, Aditya? Not less than, J minus three less than 20 is not the condition, right? J minus three greater than zero. So let me take a screenshot of this and then hopefully I will be able to explain this uh, more accurately so this is our grid right so when i'm going in the right hand direction horizontally when i'm going in the right hand direction horizontally this is my boundary here my boundary is j my column boundary is j so i want up to here like up to 17 because after that i no longer have three more numbers when I'm going horizontally in the left hand direction, what is the boundary? What is the column boundary? Yeah, Satvik, that's a very lazy habit of doing Satvik. If you do it that way, when you go with negative indices, so two problems with your solution Satvik, if you use exception, as we saw last time, negative indices roll over. So when you are doing this way, it rolls over and goes up to here. Right, with negative indices, that's one of the problems. So that method neither works. The second challenge when you use this method is you're deliberately creating exceptions, which is not at all a good idea ever in any programming language. Deliberately creating exceptions is just poor programming. So on this side, what is the boundary? Zero, someone already said that. How about on the top, what is the boundary? Okay, so less than count. On the bottom also there is a boundary, but unfortunately in programming, this is i equal to zero. So i equal to zero starts here. i equal to 20 is here or i equal to 19 is here. This is the difference between programming grids and uh, Math grids, math grids, the row numbers are kind of, uh, or programming grids, the row numbers are kind of inverted. So I equal to zero starts there, I equal to 19 starts here. So you have boundaries, you have four boundaries and you have to make sure that your indices of, you have two indices for any given number. You have the row index and the column index. And those two indices have to be within these four boundaries. That's all you have to make sure. So that's really the idea and you can continue doing it. Choose one more direction and I'll do for that direction and copy this code. Rest of you can try for two more directions. Choose one more direction and I'll do the code for that direction. Which direction should I try? Up, which up? Which up? Vertical up or diagonal up right or diagonal up left. So there are three upward directions, right? Which up do you want me to do? Vertical up, okay. Vertical up is relatively easy, okay. Up left, okay. So I'll do this diagonal up left. So if what? So in the diagonal up left, I'm subtracting i minus three and j minus three. Both of them have to be greater than zero. So if i minus three is greater than zero and j minus three is greater than zero, then I have a chance for getting a diagonal up left product. So that one is, uh, I'll just copy paste this. i minus one, j minus one. 
i minus 2 j minus 2 and i minus 3 j minus 3 and i'll add this product to the list of products so i'll give you this code in the chat window you guys try to do so so far we did diagonal up left and horizontal right so try to do vertical up and horizontal down left sorry vertical down left so this blue one so do this direction in the blue and do this direction in the top because then we have exhausted all the directions right if you go this direction or this direction the products will be kind of you'll really have similar products if you go in this and this these two are complementary this and this are complementary so do this vertical up and the diagonal down left those two directions so let me give you this code in the chat window oops my chat window is not showing up i'll probably stop sharing and then maybe my chat window will show up okay now it shows up yeah i post oh actually you guys can copy the number grid from copy the number grid from the homework uh, or I'll, I'll actually share my collab link let me share my collab link let me open a new collab link and just paste this so that you guys can copy easily from there uh, new notebook and then i'll share this uh, okay share copy link change to anyone yeah. anyone with the link copy link done okay hopefully okay so try going to that link hopefully you can access it okay so what the goal is to basically try calculating diagonal diagonal down left product and vertical up product So you just have to calculate two more products. You don't have to calculate four more, pro six more products. You just calculate two more, and then print max of the list of products. If any of you need help understanding this, please let us know. We can split into breakout rooms and try helping you guys. But please try for at least five minutes. Try for five minutes, and then we'll do this. uh sure if you want to use your original code use your original code yeah very nice prince yeah that's the correct answer i think right yeah that's the correct answer yeah yeah no problem yeah use your original code no big deal yeah prince that's the correct answer
max product okay perfect If any one of you have questions or if you are having trouble doing this, uh, let us know and maybe we can split into breakout rooms and help you guys. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, how many of you guys finished this and got the answer? Yeah, today also we can have no report. We are only reviewing homework, right? We are only doing this because list is the max number of points we could get in this session, 200 points. I don't know, I didn't check. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, probably, I don't know. Let's check. Uh, okay. So 130, 150. Oh, <laughs> I seem to have made it. Yeah, okay, yeah, 200. Yeah, correct. Yeah, we can have no report today also because we did mostly homework. No, homework score was not posted. Report isn't very good. Yeah, because we didn't cover much today. There is no report. But next class, we can have quiz on all the topics up to today. Yeah, no, report scores were not posted. Yeah, we had some issues. We haven't posted scores. We can do shorter homework because we are going to learn very less today, less new stuff today. So we can do shorter homework, not no homework. <laughs> My code is running for a long amount of time. Is this because there is an infinite loop or because the code actually takes a long amount of time? Um, yeah, we will we'll learn in four more minutes. We'll start learning a new topic. What we are learning is getting basically getting familiarization. So it might look like we are wasting time on homework problems for those of you who already did homework problems well, but it's more about the thinking process really. So for some of you who couldn't attempt, this is thinking process. For some others, it's familiarization process. No, it shouldn't take a long time, Vibhush, I think, because there are 400 numbers, right? How many products can you calculate for each number? Assuming eight, all eight directions, you have a product. You can only calculate 3,200 products. But the actual number of products is, I think, something around 2,500 or 2,800 only. So the code shouldn't take a long time. Maybe there is an infinite loop or maybe there is a mis mistake somewhere. But anyways, let's see. Uh, hopefully, we can uh, complete this one. So did you guys, did any one of you get the answer since you started doing this, like using your code now? Did you get the answer? So any of you, did you get the answer now when you tried the code now? Anybody? Okay. So two or three people got it. Okay, did anyone else other than Shruti Satyanarayanan get the answer right now? Okay, Kairo Sharma got it, Sai. Okay, cool. Okay, so then good. If a few of you got it, then we'll continue to the next one. So this is more familiarization. I'll tell you again a short story from this time my from my own life. Uh, yeah, it's a diagonal product, very good to know. So how do you know that it's a diagonal product? Let's see now. 
so some of you actually seem to know these things but let me uh, make a little bit of a product array so i'm going to create a new thing called product array the elements in that product array will be the horizontal product the direction in which i went and the four elements that made it so since uh, lists can have whatever since lists can have whatever uh, elements you want of any data type i am using this list which has uh, some numbers and some this and then i'll also put my index at what point i was when i got this so product array and then i'll do the same thing for this one also so i'll put diagonal left product and uh, diagonal up left product so now i minus 1 j minus 1 i minus 2 j minus 2 i minus 3 j minus 3 and then when i append to list of products i'll append the product uh, product instead of appending this one i'll append a list so i'm making a 2d list here again without doing all the directions let me just print max of list of products so i'm creating a product list basically which uh, tells me something so without doing all the directions with just two directions it is telling me that this is the max product this is in horizontal right and this is the position where it is in eighth row tenth column and these are the four elements so as you can see as you extend list lists to two dimensional lists you can have list within a list and end have a lot of useful properties so i could just read out of of my list what the product is where it started and everything else right so this is a use case of two dimensional lists without worrying too much about uh, how many elements there are and this helps us if i finish all the directions i'm sure i'll also get the same answer that you guys got so just uh, so that i can finish in the next minute or so uh, let's see so which directions did i want to do i wanted to do vertical up so basically i minus 3 greater than 0 alone vertical up product so for that i have to increment i s i minus 1 and j i minus 2 and j i minus 3 and j and then this is the vertical up product and then this is vertical up so starting with oh i made a mistake somewhere in storing the numbers oh no i didn't make this okay so i minus 1 and j i minus 2 and j i minus 3 and j then i wanted to calculate a diagonal down left so if i am going down one number is increasing one number is decreasing so the i number is increasing and the j number is decreasing so i plus 3 less than uh, length of number grid and j minus 3 greater than this i'm hoping i'm doing in the right directions uh yeah and this is less than okay so diagonal down left product so diagonal down left uh, i plus 1 j minus 1 i plus 2 j minus 2 and i plus 3 j minus 3 so hopefully i covered all the combinations let's see if i covered or not and i also got it diagonal down left so it's the same answer that you guys got of course i don't have to do eight directions i was just trying to make you get comfortable with indices when i said try all eight directions but 
you can just do four directions and get the same answer so that's this that's all the homework stuff and list familiarization so now to the next two topics of the day can you explain that again which one uh, probably right i want to check okay i'll just check avinish solution because he's the first one to ask that okay go to the last problem calculating max in horizontal direction okay max of uh, grid differ okay that's good yeah looks correct yeah yeah avinish it looks correct you are doing more with list comprehension than with this right yeah looks fine good idea okay cool so now that we have this so let's try a simple example uh, to to motivate the next uh, topic uh, how many of you have a user account in some website any user account in some website okay so user accounts typically have two things right what are the two pieces that user accounts have username password so let's say my user account for something is karthik my password is uh, malasani so if i had uh, a list with two elements mm -hmm. so if i had a list with two elements uh, basically i'll assume uh, first one is uh, username second one is password okay doesn't seem harmful right so i'll call this list credentials and if i want to print a uh, username it's uh, credentials of zero right and it's my if i want to print password it's credentials of one right simple straight forward i'm not doing anything fancy here i'm just trying to motivate what the next item so if i do credentials karthik and malasani then i got username is karthik and i can assume that the password is malasani straight forward nothing complex but is this so what happens if i do credentials of 0 equal to mm, not karthik would this allow me to change this can i change it like this yes yes okay so let's see yeah so now it now my username got changed to not karthik uh is this desirable in my case i want this to represent this list to represent my username and password so is this manipulation desirable not really can you think of any other situations where you don't want your list elements to be manipulated think of some practical situations of where you could use a list and you don't want your yeah that's where we are going satvik that's the programming concept where we are going but practical example of where you don't want your elements within your list to be changed any practical example bank account details okay good you don't want your bank account details to be changed your name yeah you absolutely your first name last name you don't want it to be changed your social security number good you don't want it to be changed very good <laughs> you don't want yourself to be changed yeah that's a little hard to do it with a list also right so what would the list look list is shreyan and then list is equal to shreyan's brother or something school email yeah those are all examples where you don't want so list is a data structure it has some elements if you don't want it to be changed you can't stop it right you can't stop the list from being changed by somebody however there are a lot of instances where you don't want your data elements to be changed you guys gave a few examples jerry you have a password to your toilet paper supply that's interesting is your toilet paper digital 
Okay. So, in this case, if we don't want it, Amazon account, yeah, people might have a full vault full of it, yeah. Those days are gone, Jerry. People are no longer stockpiling on toilet paper anymore. So, if you don't want your list to be changed, if you don't want your list to be changed, we there is a way to do this. It's called a tuple. Credentials tuple. In Python, it's called a tuple. Yeah, no more holders, yeah. Yeah, maybe they're stockpiling on mass. So only difference between a list and a tuple is, there are a lot of differences, but only difference is, can you see the difference here just from my screen? What's the difference between credentials list and credentials tuple? Parenthesis. So instead of square brackets, we are using parentheses. That's all right. So nothing fancy. Code wise looks the same, but it changes pretty much everything. A lot of things, not everything. It changes a lot of things. So I could do this, right? Already we know I could do this. Mm -hmm. So if I do credentials tuple of zero equal to not Karthik. So let's see. See, it says tuple of, oops. can you see the error? It's showing me that on this line, I have an error. And what is the error? Tuple object does not support item assignment. So what does this mean? This just basically means that once you create a tuple, you can't change the elements within the tuple. So why are they useful? Why are tuples useful? Lists were very useful and we kept on advertising the usefulness of a list as being, you can append elements to a list, you can remove elements from a list, you can modify elements in a list, you can sort elements in a list. All of these were advantages of a list. But now we are saying a tuple doesn't allow you to modify and that's also good. Does that seem good that the tuple doesn't allow its mod elements to be modified? Can you append elements? Okay, let's try. Credentials tuple dot append my credentials. Okay, I should first get rid of this one so that I don't uh, run into the same issue. So tuple attribute object has no attribute append. Yeah, so it also does not let you append. So you can't add elements. What is your guess? Can you remove elements from a tuple? What would you guess if you had to guess? Can you remove? No, okay, let's see. So doesn't let you to remove, do you think it would let you to pop? Probably not. So basically it doesn't allow you to change at all. Once you create it, it's there, that's it and doesn't change after that. Yeah, they are the same thing. Yeah, yeah. they are the same thing, right? Yeah. So, doesn't allow you to change. So whenever you see, actually, if you search somewhere online, they, call, they keep calling, you can still print, yes. What can you do? You can still do a few things. Mm -hmm. So you can print credential tuple. You can print credentials list. Both will work the same way, right? It just printed slightly differently with a different parenthesis. Let's see what we can do. So first let's make a list. I will open an Excel file. Mm -hmm. So what is it? So I'll open a list. And so what were the things? We checked append, remove, pop, modify elements. Those are the things we checked. So let's see what are the things you want to check. Tell me what are the things you want to check and then we will check. Printing. What else do you want to check? Copy, okay, sorry. If it would help if I print type, type. Copy, sort, okay, length. Okay, what else do you want to check? 
copy sort length what else reverse okay good reverse extend okay extend max sum okay what else modifying replacing an element yeah modifying meaning replacing an element modifying element value i would say modifying element value so you also want to say loop access by index right you want to check those also insert okay insert up and yeah same thing okay so i'll say we'll check insert at uh, insert at index okay anything else max already somebody said that min uh, yeah max min okay any other list operations that you guys want to verify can you do a 2d tuple okay 2d tuple let's check that also okay what else count okay count uh, okay count okay what else <laughs> yeah if you can do a 2d tuple you can do a 3d tuple any other operations that you guys want to try okay now in the next 5 minutes as an exercise oh list x uh, list append tuple okay append list to tuple and uh, okay extending but yeah extending a list by a tuple <laughs> okay adding two lists you want to do adding to adding two lists or tuples multiplying list with uh, number or tuple with number you can try these operations also okay so now i'm copying in the chat window all these operations all of you guys you declare your own tuples your own lists declare your own tuples and lists list and tuple and as you do it start from appending start from appending and you tell me whether uh, numpy dot yeah most of it are done already yeah most of it satvik are done numpy dot prod is a separate thing i'll not do it now okay so let's start with this much let's start with this much so far we have about 21 operations we already know list allows this tuple does not allow so we'll put uh, actually let's see if i can insert a symbol here uh, yeah that's what i want you guys to figure out satvik how do you make a huge list into a comment uh, i don't know what do you mean sir? oh you, you mean like select all the lines and then comment in one shot like is that what you mean shruti yeah yeah one second yeah so let me show one second so let me put this okay so hopefully this is size enough i'll make this green color i'll make this red color so if you want to make a big comment like that i think i just you just have to do control and all this and then control c no, control k c control k and c together control oh yeah so control plus k and plus c together you can highlight it and then plus control question mark oh it depending on your editor yeah in some editors it may be control question mark i don't know it yeah it looks like in collab control question mark works someone in waiting room jonathan in waiting room yeah okay so yeah you can sort tuple turns into a list oh uh, yeah correct you can do it yeah the sum of a tuple works but only for numbers or you can also do this uh, i think no doesn't work no doesn't work so multi line comment this way doesn't work okay so 
and please do each operation so declare your own so start with this declare your own list and declare your own tuple with two or three elements doesn't have to be hundreds yeah multiple quotations also works as a multi line comment yeah that's what i was just showing yeah but it's yeah so declare your own list and your own tuple and tell me each operation so append does a list allow appending and a tuple allow appending just answer yes no does a list allow appending can you append elements to a list yes okay can you append elements to a tuple no okay now how about removing elements from a list can you remove elements from a list yes okay so i'll copy the green check box can you remove elements from a tuple no we already know pop and remove are the same so i'll put the same thing modifying element value can you change the element value of the first element in a list can you change it yes how about changing the element value in a tuple no okay how about printing a list can you print a list yes can you print a tuple yes can you copy a list what do you mean by copy a list first of all how do you copy a list so if i want to do credential list 2 how do you copy this list list dot copy okay good do you think you can copy a tuple okay let's try so tuple has no attribute called copy but what if i just assign like this that seems to still work so i could assign assign one list to other versus copy one list from another so assign versus copy so if i copy one list from another it works for tuple there is no copy method if i assign one list to another it works so if i say list 2 equal to list 1 it works right there is no error so if i print credential list 2 or credential tuple 2 they should print the same thing oh let's see if they print the same thing so they are printing the same thing if a assignment works but copying doesn't work for tuples now sort can you do list dot sort okay let's see credential list dot sort or credential list 2 dot sort and credential tuple 2 dot sort what about tuple can do you think tuple would allow sort anybody guesses would tuple allow a sorting yes okay let's see so now tuple doesn't allow sorting why doesn't it allow sorting because when you are sorting you are changing the tuple right you are changing the position of elements in the tuple so you can think of tuple as if your name has been etched on like on a on cement or on a stone right tuple is like that whereas list is very fluid yeah exactly cannot change around your username and password exactly that's a good good logic so same thing list allows sorting tuple doesn't so reverse would tuple allow reversing yeah satvik if you so yeah no okay so no satvik when you do that minus 1 you are not you are not sorting the list you are accessing in the reverse order right satvik so what you have showed satvik uh, yeah wait a second you are not reversing satvik you are just accessing elements in the reverse order you should not uh, so let's see this uh, what do we mean by that so satvik says so if i do this print credential list of uh, colon colon minus 1 right satvik is this what you are saying this works right this will print it in reverse order but did does that change the list no if i print credential list 2 immediately after that it's not changing the list my list is still the same but if i change sort dot sort or dot reverse if i do dot sort no sort will sort the same way in my list if i do dot reverse it has now changed my list also right so 
printing or accessing and modifying the list are two separate things it's almost like saying numbers from 1 to 10 backwards that didn't change that the numbers from 1 to 10 increasing order or that way right if you are going backwards you are just reading it backwards okay so that's credentials tuple equal to reverse it okay so that is assignment subject that start reverse reversing in the same way right if i want to reverse this tuple i want to reverse credentials tuple not credentials tuple to oh actually let's see credentials tuple okay so let's print this oh good point so it's assigning with reverse sort so when you are assigning again to this list this can be changed but that's pretty much expected with it with anything else right i can make credential tuple 2 right it now changed does that mean that the list is allowing sorting no it's not allowing sorting right you have recreated that list basically that tuple you have reinitialized that tuple so you are not sorting really you are just reinitializing that okay so dot sorted is that what you're saying oh if you write a new function yeah if you write a new function that's a different story right it's not uh, sorted is its own fun yeah that's a different thing obviously you can write it my question is that does it allow it by itself it's built in okay that's not built in it's a separate function when you do this you are calling a separate function which is returning something and when you assign it to this so satvik is bringing up a good point so when i did this credentials tuple equal to 2 did i change credentials tuple or did i change the variable value so did i change this tuple or did i change the value of this variable I change the value of the variable there is a big difference between changing the tuple itself versus changing the value of the variable that contains it if i reinitialize this variable by assigning it to something else i haven't changed this i have changed this again in mathematics most of the times it doesn't make a difference in programming it makes a big difference because what we call a tuple is this on the right hand side this is just a variable of type tuple if i reinitialize it again i haven't changed it what is the difference between assign and copy when i'm copying i'm cop yeah let's see with a list it is very clear if i do it with a list so let's start with a simple list if i change this list credential list of 0 is equal to not kartik print these two lists see both the lists got changed when i assigned this list to here from here left to right when i changed one of the lists both of them got changed whereas if i do a copy dot copy undo this now only my second list got changed my first list is still the same is that clear we will get we will come to this in a few classes from now the concept if some of you want to see is called a shallow copy versus deep copy that's the programming concept behind this and in python it's very hard to see the difference but in some programming languages it's trivial to see this difference when you are making a shallow copy versus a deep copy and for any of you who are who know like something like c++ or c that's where these are very very dangerous when you make a shallow copy versus a deep copy you are like making a big mistake in these languages maybe some of the older languages also may have it maybe like cobol has it i don't know if cobol even has it but some of the older languages this is a disaster but even python this is a problem whether you copy a list like this versus whether you assign a list value like this it makes a difference so while the immediate end result look immediate result looks like they are the same thing this thing does a shallow copy that means it copies the elements from one list to the other 
this thing does a deep copy that means it keeps a link between the first list and the second list so very uh, different ones rohan there is 33 more minutes if you want to leave now you can leave and then we can talk about homework okay so coming back to our excel file how about length so is this clear like where satvik or uh, whoever was mentioning when i am reversing this i am not really reversing this tuple i am reversing this reinitializing this variable while the end result is a programming trick of changing the value of the variable it's not really what is happening if i was not reinitializing this value because using the same logic as you said i could even change the tuple to become a integer right but that's just re redeclaring this list mm -hmm. okay so are you saying anything no i'm not saying anything yeah so yeah this is assignment again satyuk you are confusing assignment between manipulation right what is what this is doing is it's re reversing this this tuple and assigning to this tuple let's with that same logic is this even a tuple at this point at the start yeah, yeah you can do it at the start but at the start you have once you have defined this you are not able to modify it other than by reinitializing it with that same logic if you see my screen did i say credential tuple equal to 2 i basically broke a tuple right so by reinitializing we are not doing anything we are we are are by redeclaring that list yeah exactly but the list itself does not allow that operation how about length uh, do you think both the both of them will have a length property they're not changing anything by doing length yeah so is it allowed so let's check this uh does that allow length of a tuple yes okay Oh, some something here about let's delete all the stuff. I reinitialize this. Okay, so looks like length is allowed. No, no, I I had uh, changed it to list is two. How about extend? So can I extend a list? What does extend do? Okay, I can extend a list. what about can i extend a tuple let me see if i do this way with this oops now it doesn't have an extend method extending a tuple modifies it very good so how about max of a tuple or max of a list should work okay let's try yeah works how about min then 
min is the same so i'll just put here the same how about sum would this do sum actually would sum work on these two yeah it's an integer it's not an integer so this is not working so i'll just put 1 and 2 for just to check if sum works on both so sum works on both okay how about looping through elements can i loop through the tuple and uh, list yes okay good can i access elements in a tuple and a list by using indices okay you want to check yeah we can check so let's check so for element in credential tuple we know for list it already works print element so it prints yeah so looping through a list or looping through a tuple both work accessing by index can i do credential tuple of zero so it works we know already for a list it works inserting a element at a position in a list does it work for a list for a list okay for a list it works right yeah we already saw that for a tuple should it work no okay min should also work because oh sorry 2d tuple let's see does a 2d tuple exist i don't know i've never tried it myself but let's see so if i do this is my username password uh let's say satvik's username password is this or name so let's see does it allow looks like it didn't complain so let's see if i can print this so i can have two d tuples yeah yeah i'll share that excel that's why i'm typing in that excel yeah so 2d tuples are allowed how about count what is count of tuple right or couple tuple dot count right sorry count takes exactly one argument so opposite so first let's do list dot count is that this way no maybe i'm doing it wrong count of list yeah i'm doing it wrong right it counts how many specific elements yeah okay count is not defined i'm doing something wrong count is a tuple function okay let's do count out if a tuple function okay maybe i declared count somewhere okay let's see tuple dot count okay let's try tuple dot count count of karthik let's try that yeah i think what we that's not how you use it so you take the tuple what credentials tuple dot count and i tried that already right yeah oh dot count of that element okay got it yeah i'm sorry good yes. point yeah so it counts yeah. yeah so this is not count right this is count of number of times count of number of times an element is present an element yes. is present in a list yeah good point thank you so okay so this seems to work for a tuple and for a list append list to a tuple we already saw it doesn't have an append really so append list to a list would work append list to a tuple wouldn't work right append list to list uh, tuple to tuple or list to tuple to tuple so one of them should work and other should not work appending a tuple to a list okay let's try so credentials list dot append of a tuple uh, let me make this a single one dimensional one so if this works okay so it worked so now if we print the credentials list it worked so it has a new element which is a tuple okay so we can append uh, so 
we can do list to list tuple to tuple so list plus tuple or tuple plus list or append basically this is allowed this is not allowed right list play, list can be append tuple can be appended to a list but list cannot be appended to a tuple and multiplying with a number so what if i do credentials list time to what would this do okay so it repeated the list two times if i do credentials list times four it repeats the list four times yeah it du duplicates the list okay, by appending it yeah it's like list multi extending making copies of the list so you can do the same thing with tuple let's see can we do yeah looks like you can do the same thing when does the entire ai classes end i don't know i haven't calculated the date you can calculate based on the number of weeks yeah there is a syllabus you can look at that and you can find out so all these are allowed you can examine other properties that are there for a list or a tuple you can examine other properties that uh, are there and verify whether they are allowed for a list or property but what we have done so far is we have examined two two collections of objects now going a little higher two collections these are two collections of objects or collections of variables specific properties of a tuple only i don't know if there is anything that a tuple has but no other thing has i don't know this class ends at 12 o'clock next class uh, starts in two weeks from now so specific properties that are only for a tuple but not for a list i'm not sure but uh, there may be i don't know if you if you find it let me know zipping yeah i don't know if uh, so if i have zip of uh, this right so you just you are trying to say this list dot zip of this tuple is that the syntax that you are referring to that you want to see or is that just a zip of uh, list comma tuple looks like it did something i don't uh, let's see what is what is the end result yeah so this is only for iteration for i in for element in final list yeah looks like it does zipping so zipping of a list and a tuple is allowed so it works yeah so you can zip a tuple with a tuple a list with a list so zip is a special function what it does is if you give it two lists let's say for example i have two lists no it doesn't have an attribute it's a special function i think username password credentials order and credentials list if i zip these two lists then what happens is uh, when it prints say it printed username karthik and password malasani so what it does is it takes the first element of the first collection matches it to the first element of the first collection takes the second element of the second collection matches it to the second element of second collection but if you change the order of elements here it still matches 1 mm -hmm. to 1 2 to 2 3 to 3 and so on it doesn't automatically change this collection's order so that doesn't really it helps in some cases so zip is a specific function no it's it allows for lists also first i tried with a list only right so i can try credential order and credentials list also so it allows for a list as well so the zip function returns a collection which has tuples as the elements so uh, you, this is a special function you can find read about it online zip function it allows you can zip 
two lists together list with list list comma list is allowed tuple comma tuple is allowed and list comma tuple is also allowed no nipun de no 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 you should you, you, so nipun what is the use of a zip versus a to do list nipun it's easier uh, but what if i want a few attributes together what if my name is kartik malasani it has first name last name i have to define a list with first names and define a list with last names and then zip them together no right to do lists have a purpose zipping has a purpose they are not interchangeable though they seem to have some similarities they are not interchangeable they are easy to use for certain specific instance if i take a graph paper i can represent that with a to do list right i can represent all these points with a to do list how do i represent this with a zip unless i take the points in some order and then say okay only this this point goes with this point this point was but if i give you a bunch of 20 points on this scattered all around and i want to say find the minimum bounding circle around that then you can't do that right with a zipped list but if you want to save the collection of points you want a to do list so they are not interchangeable in utility they are similar in some aspect that they are both two dimensional objects but they are not similar in utility so that's the difference so now now that we have seen these collections what we have seen so far is basically collections these are all of these two things and we'll see two more collections one collection called sets and one collection called dictionaries we'll see all these collections but so far based on seeing this if you notice all the common green checks right wherever there are common green checks those are the properties that are common to collections in general may not be common to all collections but common to some collections or some sequences these are all called actually i think up to here they are all called sequence types yeah uh, next class dictionaries right what did we say this class yeah i don't even remember which class but we'll see in next class dictionaries and uh, sets we can try a little bit and then you can explore some of this as homework so let's try sets how many of you know sets in mathematics already do you know yeah okay okay so let me try a small trick a small thing here so that we can see so list uh, uh, of numbers is equal to 1 2 2 1 2 3 2 1 1 2 right this is list of numbers okay now tuple of numbers i'm just doing a very simple tuple and simple list tuple of tuple of numbers is equal to 1 2 3 2 1 right yeah we will get there we will get there now i want to do a set of numbers how do i do a set of numbers anybody curly brackets okay so we used up two other brackets we'll use the remaining bracket so now let's see if i print list of numbers tuple of numbers a yeah, good 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 guess and then set of numbers let's see what happens so do you see any difference here in the final outputs for set of numbers versus list of numbers or say tuple of numbers no in the output what's the difference in the output when i printed there was something that happened they don't print repeating numbers okay so what do you think if i check the length of this list length of this list length of this tuple and length of this set what do you think will be the length of the list and set 553 okay let's see absolutely 
So this is again a collection of numbers or a collection of items or collection of elements. Each collection is has some similarities that they are a collection of certain elements, but each thing comes with their own properties. A list is the first one that we saw. It has a lot of properties and it allows changing the elements within the list. A tuple is the second one that we saw. It also has a lot of properties, such a lot of methods, but it doesn't allow you to change the elements within the tuple. Set is the third one that we are seeing. If you go to a set, it doesn't actually have any duplicate elements. Even if you try to do add a duplicate elements. So let's see, I don't know if there is a set dot append. So if I append four and four two times and then print the set. Oh, no append method. Uh, I have to Google this. I don't use this regularly enough. So set to Python append. Add, okay, so set, like true set theory as add. Okay, let's see. So it only added the element once. If you notice here, even though I'm adding it multiple times, it only added it once. Can you think of one good example where sets are useful? So basically a set does not accept duplicates. Even if you add it, it does not. Account numbers, when you don't want duplicates, okay? Yeah, give any, give any example in real world where you don't want duplicates. Usernames, okay. Collecting, pos yeah, collecting possible answers to a question, good. Password, student numbers, good, okay. When we are trying to find multiples, yeah, very good, okay. Okay, cool. So you guys can think of real world examples where a collection like this is meaningful, right? So if you used just a list to generate your student ID number, so if you are creating an application and you used a list, you take the max of the list and add one, then it might be fine. But if two people are doing it and maybe somehow the list is getting manipulated at two times, maybe you'll end up getting max two times, same max two times and then you add it twice you'll give the same list. So what I mean by that is, max of list is max of list of numbers. If I do it two times, it's still the same max. Then if I add list numbers dot append, max list, max list one and max list two. Of course I'm doing it two times immediately, but what if I was doing it two times in two different places in my program and I do this, this has now given me two elements of three and three. So now my list length increased to seven. If I print my list, it will have three twice. Or if I do plus one here, it will have four twice, right? So if you don't want duplicates, even accidentally, you should use sets. So now summarizing, these are three collections, list tuples, create a list with many numbers, each number is an ID number, the set will delete repeats. So you have a list with unique duplicated, with unduplicated numbers, yeah, absolutely, yeah, very nice. So this is, this is the main idea basically that you have collections, these are what, these are commonly known as collections or sequence types. If you Google it, you'll commonly see the words that lists are mutable collections, if you Google anywhere, maybe you'll find this. Tuples are immutable collections. That means you can't change them once you create them. And sets are uh, distinct or unique collections. Do sets remove duplicates with strings as well? Let's try, let's try that also. So Simran, good question. So I want to get set of names. I'll say Karthik, Karthik, and then uh, Nip, Simran, Nipun. And I'll print this set of names. Da, 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 da. 
so it it removed the set of names but another interesting thing happened here can you tell me first of all it it removed the duplicate karthik but it also did one more strange thing here what was the strange thing sorted it changed the order actually yeah that's the thing basically there is no order at all that's what this means so let's print this a few times so this time it's printing simran yeah this is now printing with some order it's not sorted but it's printing so let me add someone else's name aditya now it's still printing in that order so there is no guaranteed order but it's repeating the same order okay we'll add five okay so now it printed five first it seems to be printing with some direction but there is no so random in a way in a way yeah so you shouldn't expect to so if i print set names of zero if i print this oops so see basically it is saying that i cannot do this so i can try set names of zero this way hopefully it says the same thing with even square brackets i'm trying all the ways in which you can put an index into this oh i still am making a mistake yeah set doesn't support indexing so basically since the order of elements is random yes it differentiates between 5 and 5 yeah nipun 5 and 5 are different right we already saw that you can go through elements so it printed 5 5 two times nipun simran kartik aditya Because hot stuff closing on the window. So, uh, sorry, someone was saying something. It closed because the fire was lagging. Literal fire, literally, garmi ke aag. Okay, somebody probably is not on mute. If you are uh, not talking about something. It's probably clear about... in one hundred. Okay, cool. So, set of names, uh, set of things, whatever. it basically allows does not allow duplicate but it also does not allow you to access an element by even its index accessing by index is not possible in a set so the second property that is common to lists and tuples are that they are ordered that means the order in which you add is the order in which you get back but sets don't even have an order so you add whatever order you want but it gives you whatever order it wants so those are some differences so now in the last 5 minutes we'll discuss homework for this class as i mentioned we will do less homework this time but you should go and prepare for quiz next class we will have like a 10 question quiz at the beginning of the class that's why i'm not giving you enough homework so that you can spend time on figuring out and the material that we will have the quiz on or the test on is uh, let's see where is the syllabus uh, when will we learn functions yeah in two more classes from now i think so so up to session 6 basically we'll have all of this session 4 5 no 4 5 and 6 quiz from 4 5 and 6 so you basically prepare for your your majority of your homework is revising material from sessions 4 5 and 6 there will be 10 questions on your quiz and 30 minutes so that's uh, next class and then after the 30 minutes we will also learn a little bit about dictionaries and file io and then start with functions after that class so satvik in two classes from now we'll start functions so homework one is revision so first homework item is revision so you don't have to submit anything homework revise sessions 4 5 and 6 content and get familiar the next homework is fill out this grid so whatever we had in this grid i would like for you to fill out these grids completely fill out grid of all possible operations on lists tuples and sets and which operations are allowed and not allowed 
So yeah, for lists, tuples, and sets. So I'll just uh, list the operations. You can extend the operations if you want. You don't have to. I'll not. Uh, you can even copy paste from it, but you should have code to show that this is working, right? At the end, you should have some code to show this example. Just the Excel file. Just the Excel file, but you also should have some code to show that this is working. So this is homework uh, zero. So no points for this one. Homework one, 50 points. Anyone else? Yeah, for each operation, you should have some code to show whether it works or not. Yeah, for each operation. So that's why basically I think you have a lot. So you have 23 operations. So basically you'll have uh, uh, 69 codes. Yeah, class is over. We are going over the homework. So you'll have to at least put 69 of this. So I'm assuming there will be 25 operations. So you guys can add two more operations like union, intersect. So let's take these 25 operations and then write code. Yeah, but one line each. So easy. Yeah, it's very easy. Basically, you just have to write one line each. Yeah, it's just 75 lines doing very straightforward. So 75 points for that. And if you want to write a report for 25 points, report for 25 points. Because we went over very less content in this class, you can write a report. So just two questions and revision. But why report? <laughs> very short report. You can write one page report. One page? Yeah. There were, what? Oh, I can't. Okay, you can, write, you can write a short report, which is like half page. So minimum yeah. half page. Can we use super big font size? <laughs> okay, font size no greater than 12. Whoever that is, thank you for the obvious trick. Do we have but to I have comments in the code? It's up to you if you want to have comments in the code. Wait, how about spaces? Are we just allowed to put a bunch of spaces? Okay, thanks for that suggestion also. No more than two sp one space between two words. Next time, maybe I should introduce character limit. Maybe I should say it should be for 200 characters at least. Whoever this was, uh, thank you for your hints. Okay, so the, that's 100 points. But this is relatively much easier in terms of thinking. It's more work in terms. Okay, thanks, Shreyan. <laughs> so it's relatively easy because you don't have to think much. You have to type a little bit. Yeah, so this report is usually, yeah, so this report is really long and with really small font. Okay, cool. So that's pretty much it. If you guys don't have any other questions, just two questions for your homework this time, but lots of typing. For the grid question, if something prints an error, should we just comment? Yeah, sure. You can comment it out if something prints an error. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot for attending. If you guys have any questions, you can stay back. Otherwise, we are done. Oh, I'll send the Excel. I'll send the Excel prints. Don't forget to subscribe and like. If you have any questions, you can email info at agoramatrico.org or comment below and we'll reply back. Maybe. And if you want to see practice things or anything about us, you can visit our website, which is basically the end of the email, but without the info and the end. So bye!